Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. And today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with District of Sparwood Mayor David Wilkes. Now, nestled in the picturesque Elk Valley of British Columbia, the District of Sparwood is a vibrant and welcoming community known for its stunning natural beauty and robust coal mining industry. Now, with a population that embraces both the warmth of small town living and the spirit of outdoor adventure, Sparwood offers a unique blend of tranquility and economic vitality. Surrounded by the towering peaks of the Canadian Rockies, Sparwood is a haven for nature enthusiasts as well as outdoor lovers. The Elk River flows through the district, providing opportunities for fishing, kayaking, and riverside strolls. Hiking and biking trails crisscross the landscape, offering breathtaking views of the surrounding mountains and showcasing the region's rich biodiversity. Now, at the heart of Sparwood is the mining heritage, a legacy that has shaped the community's identity. Visitors can explore the mining terminus, a unique outdoor museum that plays homage to the town's mining history and the machinery that fueled its growth. Sparwood's close-knit community spirit is evident in its lively events and festivals, bringing residents together to celebrate their shared history and diverse cultures. With its breathtaking scenery, economic vibrancy, and strong sense of community, Sparwood stands as a testament to the harmonious coexistence of industry and nature in the heart of the Elk Valley. This is Cross Border Interviews with Mayor David Wilkes. David, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start at the beginning, and I want to learn a little bit about you before we learn a little bit about the District of Sparwood. And I want to get to know where your sense of duty to serve comes from, because I looked at your electoral uh, history, and you seem to like to serve you, the people of Canada, particularly Sparwood. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, it probably goes back to... Uh my three uncles that were there in the RCMP. Uh, they all joined the RCMP in the 1950s and uh, I got to watch them as, as a kid. Uh, uh, my dad had unfortunately passed away when I was eight uh, to illness and uh, they were a big part of my upbringing. And I used to watch them and I thought, you know, that's kind of cool what they're doing. And uh, as a result of that, uh, you know, joined the RCMP in 1980, uh, went to 2000 and retired. And um, and then, you know, I found a, a, a distinct likeness between policing and uh, politics, uh, specifically municipal politics. I can get into the federal side if you want me to. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you're, you're faced with problems. Uh, you try and solve them to the best of your ability. Some you can, some you can't, uh, but you do the best you can. And knowing very, very well that you're never going to please everyone. And that's police work, and that's municipal politics, and uh, and I'm very comfortable in that role. And, and I really try, I really want to try and make our community the best that it can be, recognizing that some of the things we do are, are not going to be... Uh, appreciated by all shall we say that um but uh, it's not done out of malice it's not done out of 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 any of that it's you're just trying to make your community better and I, i'm just comfortable in the role is it hard is it hard to try and make the community better when you do have all those opposing factors against you with either not 100% of the people are going to agree with every issue that you vote on, not 100% of the people are going to agree with issues that you put forward, or even you try to make your community better? Is it hard to make your community better when you're trying to please as many people as possible? I think that if you stick to the message and you have a, a strong uh, council, uh, mayor and council, it makes it easier. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, in 2000, or at the yeah, 2018, uh, part of my uh, platform was that I wanted to uh, um, um, redo our, our town center. So, and uh, it came with. Um, a lot of um, concern from some people. Uh, um, our town is a relatively new town, Sparwood, uh, established in um, 
1967-68 as a result of a forced move by the uh, federal and provincial governments of the towns of Michelle and Natel. Um, so there's a lot of history. And part of our downtown core, which was uh, was remembered so underground coal mining. But um, it was getting old. The last time it had been redone was 1986. And uh, so some people in town felt that, oh, why would you ever want to do that? And other people going, oh, it's a great idea uh, for the most part. But as you know, um, uh, in municipal politics, um, the loudest voice is, is, low, is normally the detractors. They're the loudest voice. And um, so we went, we went, we moved forward. Um, uh, most of it was done via grants or by donations. A uh, project that was around uh, 4 million and we covered off about 3.5 million roughly on grants and donations. While the 500,000 that we put into it, the world came to an end. Like it just came to an end. You went, oh my God, you know, what have you done? And, um, but you look at it now and, and even the detractors go, oh, we didn't see the vision. We didn't really understand what you're trying to do, but oh, this looks great. There are still some people in town that are hung up on the $500,000. But, you know, uh, that's the way it goes. Um, and that's okay. Uh, but is it a challenge? Yeah, it's a challenge, um, but I don't get hung up on it because, again, as in police work, I do the best that I can, knowing full well that I'm never going to please everybody, but I've, we've done the best job that we can. You are probably one of the few people I'm able to ask this question to on this show because your your tenure in municipal politics spans almost two decades. You have a brief interruption when you go off to Ottawa to do your do uh, do your role as an MP, but you get first elected in 2002 and you were just recently reelected in 2022. Have you seen the role and the responsibilities of the municipal government change dramatically in those 20 years? Absolutely. Uh, I, I can't speak for other provinces, but I can certainly speak for British Columbia, where uh, the, the provincial government has has put a lot more on municipalities um, than they never had before. Asset management, um, accessibility um, uh, boards that we have to be uh, responsible for now. Now, just in the last couple months with regards to planning and zoning, where they're putting a lot more on municipalities. And that's a hard one to explain to your constituents because there's a cost to all of that. Um, the accessibility uh, uh, plans that the, that the province put forward, they gave us a one-time grant. But what they didn't provide us with was, was long-term funding to pay for a position to ensure that all of those uh, uh, plans and, and uh, are are updated annually. Uh, zoning and 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 um, bylaws for that perspective. This is going to be huge for small communities such as Sparwood. Maybe it can be absorbed a little little easier. Probably not much easier, but a little easier in the larger communities such as Vancouver, where they have a, a fairly robust planning uh, department. We have one person. You know, and and that one person is exceptionally busy, and and all of a sudden, oh, let's just throw this on you as well. Well, now we have to look at hiring another person, either half a position or a full time position, um, and a one percent tax increase in Sparwood is forty four thousand dollars. So let's just say we're gonna, yeah, forty four thousand dollars is a one percent tax. So let's just say we're going to hire another uh, planning assistant. Well, you're not going to get them left for less than a hundred grand. So there's two percent tax increase. There it is. So and that's not that's not even talking about everything else that's going on in the community. That's, that's just not, to hire somebody. Absolutely. So um, we're doing our operational uh, uh, tax review tomorrow. So I I have no problem telling you today because. This is coming out after that meeting. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking at an 8.5% tax increase. The mill rate is 3.1. So what we need to operate the community 
and balance to zero, which we're legally required to do by May 15th of every year, right? Is to get balance to zero is 3.1. The other 5.4 is to the province. And we can't control it. So um, I just brought mine can, up from last year. Can, can I getting... interject here for a second? Because I've got to ask Absolutely. a very stupid question to you. And I apologize yeah. if it sounds extremely stupid. Yeah. But the average resident, and I'm not painting a broad stroke here, but I think I, I do Absolutely. on the show often. The average yeah. resident does not understand a lick of what you just said. You and me as municipal people who follow and someone who's been elected understands that the province takes a large portion of that tax. But the average resident sees an 8.1% tax increase and goes, what are you doing, David? You're destroying our economy here. Yep, absolutely. How and do you, you deal I, with I, that then? Because I you... you, you... <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how you deal with it, Chris, because, uh, well, I, you know, because the challenge is that we are the only level of government that has to balance to zero. The other two can spend like drunken sailors and go into deficit. And, and I, I say that quite freely because I was a member of parliament and I watched it and I went, oh my God, like there's no end to this. You just go go around the corner from uh, Langevin Street, go down to the Bank of Canada and go, hey, guess what? We need more money. And they give you more money. Municipalities don't work that way. So the only way that we can, uh, to, that we can work within our, our little world here is to increase taxes. That's the only way we work. So, and it's it's the worst form of taxation that there is. It's land taxes based off assessment that we don't do, the province assesses, and the assessment is seven months late to begin with. Like it's based on what happened last July. So <laughs> we have, last year we had crazy assessments and everything went for hell in a handbasket. And this year it's a little more normal, but there's still some you're going, what the heck is going on here? Why is the assessment so high? <laughs> but that's the only way we get to a tax is on the assessed value of your property. So I try and explain to people that, you know, like, so we dropped the mill rate from 3.214 to 3.115. Not a lot, but we dropped it. But well, how come it, that my taxes are still going up? Because the province still wants their piece of the pie. The regional district want their piece of the pie. The school boards want their piece of the pie. Everything, everyone wants their piece of the pie. And you have to contribute to it. And if you want us to drop that 8.5, which is actually 3.1, what, what do you want me to cut? I mean, sure, I can not open the ice rink until December shut down the plant, uh, not have the current club running. And then, then now you'll hear screams. Um, oh, we could not, um, we have a robust snow plowing um, plan in Sparta. We get a lot of snow and uh, we could go around and go, you know, well, normally we get out and plow snow, um, anything more than uh, two inches or five centimeters. Uh, how about we bump that up to 20 centimeters and then we'll come out. I know what would happen. I, I'm hearing, as a former communications person for a municipality, I'm hearing all the screams on Facebook right now from oh, that. Yeah. Um, so we're limited. Anyway, sorry. You're, you're limited in the scope that you can do, but at the same time, you have to do the job. And you okay. you have navigated almost 20 years in elected politics as someone who seems to like to problem solve and try to figure out what the best path forward is. How do you do that in a time when you can't go to the people of Sparwood and say, guess what, everyone? Times are tough. Your groceries are costing more. Everything is costing more. And now we're going to exacerbate your issues. Is it hard when you look at the people? Because you are the closest to them. You don't go to Victoria to do your job. You're not in Ottawa anymore to do your job. You're in Sparwood. So the moment you make a decision on this budget, you're going to go to a grocery store and you are probably going to hear about it. How important is it for you to effectively communicate the decisions with understanding that you are going to have to sit there and listen to people who vehemently oppose you and vehemently disagree with the decisions you've made? 
exceptionally difficult. Um, no, no person wants to um, implement something that is going to be a hardship on on people. No one wants to do that. But unfortunately, we have a municipal municipality to run as well, and that and we are not uh, immune to any of the incre increases as well. Any increase that you have seen in a in your any bill that you get at home, we get the same increase except it's probably much larger, um, whether it's um, your fuel bills, your gas bills, your electrical bills, your you name it bills, we get those too. And all of that costs more money for us to run. Um, I, I was, I, I, I go for coffee every morning at A&W and um, there's uh, another group there that shall we say quite vocal in their opinions. The local and Senate, we have, as we call them in Alberta, the, the a and yeah. local Senate. I was, was going to say the, the, the unelected mayor and council. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and they're very vocal. And, and so I brought the operational budget with me this morning. And I said, here it is, boys, 8.5%. Well, that's just, uh, yeah, and off they went. And I says, okay, what do you want me to cut? You tell me what I should cut because that's the only way we can bring our 3.1% down is we have to cut something. Well, you can get rid of some of that. Uh, uh, some of those staff guys, those staff guys aren't doing anything, right? That's the first answer. I says, okay, uh, let's get rid of the CAO. We are uh, at X amounts of dollars. We still need a CAO. Uh, who do you want me to get rid of? not going to matter. They, they effectively have a position. Okay, well, let's not get rid of those guys. Let's, uh, I said, so what do you want me to cut? Well, um, let's uh, cut back on the snow removal. Okay, uh, what do you want me to cut back on? Well, you don't have to do those windrows. Okay, uh, we'll stop doing windrows. That'll save us a couple hundred grand. Um, but now I get to listen to 3,000 people complain about you got to shovel the windrow that's four feet high. Yeah. Um, so the, the challenge that, that, that a lot of people have is that, is that do, municipalities have to balance to a zero budget. Do people zero. understand the role that the municipality plays in Sparwood? Like if I was to go talk to a hundred people in Sparwood tomorrow and I say, what is the responsibility of the municipality? Would they be talking about healthcare, education, or would they be talking about actual municipal issues? Do they understand the jurisdictions that you play? No, no, I don't think so. I don't think they do. No. And it's not uh, just exclusive to Sparwood. I'm saying that for oh, the host of the show. I'm hearing this across Canada that the average resident does not understand the role that the jurisdictional role that the municipality plays. How do you tell people that's not our responsibility without telling them go talk to your MLA or MP and saying it rudely? Yeah, that's a challenge because a politician is a politician. And, and and they just believe that, well, you should be able to fix this. Um, and they don't understand where the jurisdictions lie. Even if you even if you were to ask the average person who's, whose responsibility is healthcare in Canada, they would normally default to the feds. Yeah. Where the feds don't really have a lot to do with healthcare except under the Health Act, but and the transfer payments that they provide to the provinces, but the provinces run healthcare. And in fact, in British Columbia, it's one step further than that because they created the, the health authorities, which are which were created as a, as a buffer so that municipalities couldn't get at the ministers because it was getting frustrating, right? Um, so uh, it, it's really challenging. I try to 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 simplify it by saying, listen, we're water, sewer, roads, and I guess added on recreation and fire protection services that's what we are after that we'll look at a level different level of government but those are the five things that we really take care of how and often are you sending people to your local mp or mla i don't send them very often 
Because um, will is it easier for you to pick up the phone and talk to your MP or MLA compared to a resident? Because when I speak to municipal leaders across Canada, that is a reoccurring theme that I'm hearing, that it is easier for the mayor or a councillor to contact their local MP or MLA than it is for an average resident, because your title kind of bears a little bit of weight for them. Yeah, uh, I would I would agree with that statement. And, and plus, we're more comfortable. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we're all we're all elected officials. Um, and uh, although um, uh, the higher you go up the ladder, the more important you think you are, um, I would I would argue uh, that the most important level of government is municipal governments because we're the ones closest to the people. We're the boots on the ground. Um, if I asked my member of parliament, Rob Morrison, to come to Sparwood and walk through Sparwood, I could say he could go unfettered the entire time he's here with the exception of the odd person that knows him because they donate to his cause. But other than that, they wouldn't know who he is. We wouldn't have a clue. I um, agree. And, and that goes in any of the 338 ridings across Canada. Um, oh, I would I even say that with your local MLA, I'm assuming the local MLA is probably not as well known because you as the mayor you go to the grocery stores, you go to the coffee shops, you're in there at the NW. So people know who you are and you're there every day. Yeah. I have to ask a question before we turn to segment two about the district for the, about the, uh, the town of Sparwood for a second. And because you are the first person on this show who's served as an MP and then come back into serving as a, as a mayor. So this is a unique question that you only, you can answer. Do you think you were better prepared to be an MP with your municipal experience than if you had no municipal experience? No. Really? Um, yeah. Hmm. No. What I wasn't prepared for, um, and and I, I should have been, but I wasn't, was that I wasn't prepared for the partisanship. It is so partisan. It is insanely partisan. And the other thing was that I thought, because I was a mayor and councillor prior to going into federal politics, I went, oh, well, if I have an idea, I'm just going to be able to bring it to the floor and we're going to, if, if it sounds like it's a great idea, we're going to act on it. No, that's not how it works <laughs> at all. No, 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 no. This is about getting the vote. This is about winning a riding. This is about, at the end of the day, winning the election and not necessarily about anything else. And, and, and that took me back. Um, I got more done as a member of parliament working with deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers than I ever did with any minister or the prime minister who I had daily conversations with. I had way better results with the DMs and the idioms because they're there regardless of who's in power. Did and, you bring and, anything back from Ottawa as a former MP to the role as mayor? Like when you were there, you must have learned something about the political because now you were probably a little bit better as a mayor because you've seen the inside workings of what's going on in Ottawa and you know who to talk to and not to talk to. Absolutely. Yeah, I I think the biggest thing I brought back from, from Ottawa was being able to deal with the public a lot better, being, uh, being, for, being very forthcoming with them. I, I got myself in trouble in 2012 with uh, Peter Mansbridge, um, uh, what's her name, Chantal Hibert, and Andrew Coyne. I had, I went to a, um, a uh, uh, I agreed to meet some people in Revelstoke um, okay. just after the book was released in 2012. I think it was 2012. And I I'm a really forthcoming guy. You just got to come. Let's just, let's just talk. Let's just talk. And I'll tell you what it's like. That's what and, this whole show is about. And so I get to Revelstoke and, and instead of one person coming, 50 people come. And none of them are of my political leaning. Let's put it that way. Okay. So it's going to be confrontational to get from the get go. And as a result of that, um, one of them says, well, you know, why don't you just vote against the budget? And I went, okay, well, I'm going to explain to you how this works, because it's not just what you think it is. I said, you know, I could vote against the budget. 
And because it's a confidence motion budget, I would be an independent the next day and be, would be far, far less useful to you than you think I already am less useful to you because I don't politically lean your way. But I said, that's not the problem. The problem is, it's not just me you have to convince. You'd have to convince 13 other members of parliament so that you could take the government down. And they all have to be conservatives. They can't be liberal. They can't be in because that, they're going to vote against the budget anyways. That's their job. I said, you aren't going to find 13 others. And I said, you're not even going to find me. I'm giving you a hypothetical situation. Well, the world came to an end. It went on YouTube. Um, you can go watch it. Uh, and then within hours, Chief Government Whip calls me, Gordon O'Connor. Uh, we need you to go home, right? We need you to go home and we need you to go home right now. And I says, well, I got an announcement to do in Invermere for the Legion and I'm really close to veterans, you know, like, you know, uh, my whole family is involved in it. And he says, no, you're not going to, we canceled it. And I went, okay. Uh, he says, nope, go home. So I get home and then I get a call from um, the chief of staff, which at the time was uh, Nigel Wright. And he says, so we need you on the next flight to Ottawa. I said, okay. I said, can't I just come on my normal flight and be there Monday? No, we need you here Sunday. Okay, so I get on the morning flight on Sunday uh, to Calgary, fly back to Ottawa. I'm there at five o'clock. We need you to come straight to the um, WIPS office. Okay, so I go into the WIPS office and Gordon's waiting for me. O'Connor, I says, okay, Gordon, let's talk, policeman. To you're a, a retired m member of the military. What the hell's going on here? This is crazy. And he says, well, you just can't say what you said. And I says, but it's the truth. I'm, not, I'm just trying to explain to people in plain English how it works in Ottawa. Don't well, you, you know that the truth, doesn't, does, the truth doesn't matter in politics sometimes? Well, it does to me, right? It does. So, um, so he says, um, well... Um, you need to go in front of caucus on Wednesday when we have caucus meetings and you need to apologize. And I says, apologize for what? Well, you can't be saying that and you have to say sorry. I went, and if I don't, he says, you won't be, in, you won't be in caucus on Wednesday. Well, okay. I read between the lines. So I go to caucus on Wednesday and I humbly walk up to the mic and grovel out that I'm sorry and that it'll never happen again and uh, the world has come to an end. And he's, and then he said, oh, by the way, um, we're removing you from your committees. And I says, but I like health committee and I like justice committee and I'm valued on them. That's why you put me there. Yeah, well, we can't have you on there. And I says, oh, okay, where, where am I going? And he says, you're going to status of women and French French committee. And I says, oh, two of the more valued committees of, 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 the par of parliament. So off I went. And I went to those committees. I apologized to the um, um, uh, caucus. And then that was in um, the early part of June of 2000. Then. 11 or 12, I can't remember what it was. And we were doing the, um, uh, there was a filibuster going on by the uh, Liberals and the NDP with regards to Canada Post. And we were going to do back to work legislation. So we were going through the night on votes. So we were at around 10 o'clock and um, I got a message from the Chief Government Whip. Prime Minister wants to talk to you. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay. He's in the lobby. Uh, we'll have someone we had to rotate through votes so that we made sure we had numbers. So we just had to wait till I got out there. So I went over there and uh, sat down and I said, to Mr. Prime Minister, and he says, how are you doing? And I says, well, good. He says, so you got anything to say? And I went, no. I, I said, you know, I apologize if I caused you any inconvenience, but I said, it was the truth. And he says, yeah, it was the truth, but you can't say it. And I went, oh, for God's sake. So, you know, 
So uh, can I ask it, a question it, with that story? And FYI, I did not yeah. expect this to go this way. And this is the great thing about the show. I don't come in with a set rule of what we're going to talk about. I sort of okay. take my cues. So I appreciate you being candor there. You as the mayor, to get back to the municipal realm for a yeah. second here, you have to go out and tell the truth to people who do not want to hear the truth. Because okay. when we're going to talk about issues in about two seconds, but it leads this leads to that sort of segment. When people come to you with their issues, potholes that need to be fixed, parks, service levels that need to be upgraded, you okay. sometimes have to say no to them. And that is the, probably the worst thing that people want to hear from their elected officials is their issue is not going to be fixed because you just don't have enough money. How do you do that in a small town when you want the betterment of your community? I think you have to be honest with people and tell them that all, although there are a mirage of, of um, issues that you want to fix in your community, the reality is that you only have so much money yeah. and we have to work within that budget and that uh, we prioritize those um, uh, those things that people want based on what mayor and council set through a, through the uh, strategic plan. And we stick to that strategic plan. We don't vary off of it. Uh, and if you have a strong strategic plan, and you you tell it to the people in a in a proper way, they'll understand. And because I've watched in in my tenure in municipal politics, where if you don't have a, a strong strategic plan or you don't have one period, the <laughs> tail is wagging the dog. And mayor and council are along for the ride, and that's all that it is. And mayor and council have to be steering the ship driving the bus i always use the an analogy of, of driving the bus and um so i'm very forth with with people and i tell them listen you're not going to like everything i have to say but i'm telling you the truth and if i and, I, and if i don't know something i'm going to tell you i don't know but i'm also going to tell you that some of the things that you want are not what the majority of people want so Let's get over it and let's move on and do what's best for the entire community and not just a handful of people. I appreciate that on, uh, honest answer there. I want to turn to the uh, district of uh, Sparwood for a second here because I'm cautious of time and I know I said 45 minutes, so I want to try and get this in as quickly as possible. Before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is a not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the mayor's opinion. He is one vote, unless you're in New Brunswick, where the mayor does not get a vote, but he's in British Columbia. He gets one vote on council. So with that being said, uh, Mayor, what do you believe, as of recording this episode, is the biggest issue facing Sparwood today? I would say the biggest challenge that we have, oh, that's a good question, Chris, because, you know, Sparwood has been really blessed with uh, being financially much, much better than most communities in the province of British Columbia, if maybe not all. Um, we have the Elk Valley Mine Property Tax Sharing Agreement, which is a direct taxation that we have an agreement with the province that we tax the coal mines. So we have good money that way. Um, we know that we're uh, an industry-driven town with coal mines. Uh, right now, tech resources, soon to be Glencore. Um, I would say it's tempering. The, the, the challenges that we have right now are recreational in, in, in scope. Uh, people want everything, but they don't want to pay for it. Um, we had a referendum question um in 2023 or 2022 sorry um with regards to the um a new multiplex our our ice rink uh, was built in the 1970s our pool was built in the 1980s so we were looking at building a, a multiplex that be much more functional and we put the price out, 19 million. 19 million, oh my God, what are we gonna do? You're gonna borrow the money, uh, who's gonna pay for it? And I says, well, look at it this way. We can do it one of two ways. We can either borrow the money 
and get to build. Or we can do a 1% uh, tax increase on recreational services, which is $44,000, and, and save that for a gazillion years and then build it. Or we just don't do anything. But the answer to doing nothing is that people won't come to your community any longer. And in small communities such as Sparwood, recreational facilities are a big thing. It's how we attract people through our community. Um, and uh, as a result of that, there's a push-pull that the industry that is here, which is the, the coal industry, should pay for everything. But they are beholden to their um, shareholders. They're not beholden to a municipality. So it's the hardest thing to try and explain. But recreation, I would say, is our is our biggest issue. Um, housing, I don't even look at that any longer because you know what? That's a, a Canada issue. Uh, it's not just Sparwood. It's just everything. Um, in my research on Sparwood, I, I I understand that the coal mining industry is one of the most uh, is the bedrock of your economy in Sparwood. Now, just across the border in Crow's Nest Pass, we saw the coal mining industry get closed down in the last five ten years. And I'm not asking what like how are you looking at the forecast of what the mining industry is going to be looking like in Sparwood, but I'm going to ask it. But I'm going to ask it in a way that, with everything going on in Ottawa, with everything going on in uh, Victoria, with uh, environmental regulations, are you concerned that what we're seeing in Alberta with the coal mine industries being closed down across Canada that it could happen in BC, or are you optimistic that? you will be saved by some outside factor here. Because if that closes up, are you not in a bad shape economically? Oh, we're in horrible shape if it closes yeah. down. Let's say this, I'm optimistic, and I'll tell you okay. why. Um, most, uh, all of our coal is metallurgical coal. There's no thermal coal. Most of the coal within uh -huh. Alberta was, was, was thermal coal. Ours is huh. made, uh, metallurgical coal is required to make steel you don't make steel without yeah. metallurgical coal and that's all we have here and what we're one of three places arguably in north america with high grade the highest grade metallurgical coal and for us to get to a low carbon economy you need metallurgical coal to get there because it's what makes the windmills it's what makes the solar panels it's what makes uh, run a river um, energy. It's what makes steel. It's what makes rail lines. It's what makes everything. And I'm, uh, I, I would say if, if, and when we find a replacement for carbon, which I think we will at some point in time, um, but it won't be in my lifetime. Um, uh, then we'll cross that river when, when we need to, but right now there needs to be a large, educational component on metallurgical coal versus thermal coal. I appreciate that. And I didn't want to, I, you, the one thing about politics is you never talk about the thing that potentially could come, because if you do, you talk about it enough, it will come. So let's move on to a flip of my first question here. Um, I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things that are going on in communities. So I want to turn the scripts a little bit and say, what does Sparwood get right? What is the thing that you are the most proud of when it comes to the local governments and the administration and the services that you provide to your communities? Well, I'd say we got some of the best smoke removal in all of Canada, <laughs> which we're exceptionally proud of. Uh, we're envied normally around uh, most of the province by what we can do there. Um, we take care of our money. Uh, we have uh, healthy reserve funds. We don't spend beyond our means. We recognize that the importance, uh, I, I, I try and explain it to, to people this way, and Fernie is just down the road from us, and they, huge tourism with their ski hills, probably second to Whistler in, in, in British Columbia, if not Canada. But I tell them, you know, recognize what you're good at. We are good at industrial base. Fernie is good at the tourism base. Don't let the two ever get mixed up. We're good at what we do and we're good at coal mining. 
we were able to uh, attract Komatsu and bring their Western uh, Canadian operations to Sparwood of all places. And now they're doing uh, their Canadian, just about their Canadian operations out of here with repairs to certain uh, equipment. Um, that was a big deal for us to get that. Um, we recognize that um, for us to, to grow, there has to be growing pains. And, um, and, and, and although some of the locals don't like seeing uh, new ventures carrying on, they have to be done uh, because otherwise you become stagnant. And if you're stagnant, nothing happens. And then no one wants to live here. So um, we're very progressive and uh, we work, uh, uh, myself and council, um, work very strongly on a very strong strategic plan. And I, I get back to that. We have a very strong strate strategic plan and that's what makes it healthy. And you probably have the most easily easily accessible strategic plan because before this interview i was looking through some past council meetings to see what you were talking about and your strategic plan is attached to every single one of those agenda packages so good on you um i want to turn to my last subject i know you said fernie does it a little bit better about tourism but i want to learn a little bit about the tourist destinations in sparwood because i'm going to be coming through to sparwood later on this year so hopefully we can grab a coffee at AMW while i'm there but when i'm there what what should I stop and see? What should or what are some of the tourist destinations that you recommend to people? You should see. You should go and do some of the fantastic fly fishing on the Elk River. It's mm -hmm. it's it's one of the uh, premier fly fishing uh, rivers in uh, certainly in Canada, if not North America. Um, we have amazing bike trails. We have close to I believe 150 miles of uh, of bike trails that are. Uh, done by the Sparwood Trail Alliance, who we work very closely with a nonprofit. Uh, amazing bike trails throughout. Uh, you can bike all the way from Sparwood to Fernie uh, and never see a road. You, you're just on a trail, a single track trail. It's amazing. Um, going. Uh, where do you go? Where do you go at after a long day of council meetings? Where's your go-to place in the community <laughs> with without giving it away? So people are, are going to start flocking to there to start asking you questions. Where's your uh, sort of oasis that you get to that you can re refigure yourself because tomorrow you know you're going to do the same thing that you just did today? Well, in the winter, it's my Vancouver Canucks, but in the summer, uh, <laughs> in the summer, uh, there's a trail uh, uh, that uh, follows the Elk River from uh, near my place. I, I have to walk, obviously, on a couple streets to get to it, and then I get down to the to, to the Elk River, and there's a there's a trail that was built that just meanders along the Elk River, very quiet. Uh, no vehicles, uh, no bikes, no nothing, just for just for um, uh, foot traffic and uh, it's quiet it's just quiet and it's nice I want to thank you so much for doing this but before I let you go I have one last question for you and it's the million dollar question because we started talking on the show about you we're ending this conversation about Sparwood so in your opinion what makes Sparwood such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family it's it's still got that small town feel. Uh, they you you watch kids five, six, seven years old walking uh, to streets, walking to school. Um, there's no fear of them. Uh, you don't get that big city fear of oh my god, what's going to happen to my kid? It's we have some of the cleanest water in British Columbia, if not North America, to drink. Um, we live, who wouldn't want to live in the Rocky Mountains? Who wouldn't want to? And we have found a way to balance the environmental issues with large industry coal mining. And we found a balance and, and we're very proud of that. And uh, we recognize that the two must work in harmony without one outweighing the other. And with that, I think the people that live here take great pride in that and great pride in the fact that you can go, your your doorstep is just minutes away from some of the best fly fishing, some of the best um, biking trails and those types of things. 
So I'm hearing from the, the sounds of it that when I do visit Sparwood later on this year, I think fly fishing is in order for you and I, because we need to get out on the rivers just to go explore. Um, David, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk about yourself, talk about Sparwood, and thank you for serving your community. I don't think municipal politicians hear that enough. You guys do take the blunt of what is going on in this world, and you guys have some very tough decisions ahead. So I wish you the best of luck and thank you so much for talking about yourself and Sparwood today. Thanks. This has been an awesome experience. I really enjoy doing it this way. So thanks very much, Chris, and I'd be more than happy to do it again. Thank you so much, Mayor Wilkes, for joining us today. If today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations like you saw today on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as well-engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to love. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or even small, goes a long way in amplifying the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find our support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.